dear ones. Uh, once again, I, I'm a little behind in our in our lessons. Uh, I know I'm a one full week behind. I was on vacation last week. However, a retired person takes vacation. Anyway, while I was on vacation, I came down with a sore throat and cough, so I really couldn't record correctly uh, last week. Anyway, our our church. Let's just let's stop the excuses and just let's let's get down to business. This next Sunday. The, this this coming Sunday, our church celebrates our 40th anniversary, and and uh, then there's not going to be a sit down Sunday school class, so I think this might be a, a opportunity to to fill the need for that uh, weekly study. Anyway, there's a lot going on, a whole lot going on with Stan Hall recovering from some serious work done on his throat. Uh, please lift him up in, in urgent and regular prayer to so that God will soon bring he and his uh, terrific voice back to our services. Also be in prayer for Doug, uh, Pastor Doug Smith, as he finishes, I think this is his last round of chemo. Uh, at, he's been declared cancer free, but the, the chemo kind of knocks him for a loop. Uh, but be in prayer for him. And finally, let's pray for Pastor John Kirby. Uh, he's uh, He's been struggling with uh, what seems like laryngitis for about two weeks. Uh, also, we really do need to continue to pray for our nation uh, for healing. Uh, this is the most divided I think we've ever I've ever seen our country, and we need to be praying for uh, for reconciliation, healing, and and frankly for a peaceful transition, political transition. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for this opportunity to share your word and help us, Lord, to understand. Uh, the, the, the need for humility in our lives and in, in, in my life. I pray that you'll be with my voice as I try to do this lesson. Help us, Father, to, uh, to just to enjoy your word together with these who will be watching by, by live stream. Lord, thank you so much for that technology. But most of all, I thank you for you preserving your word and, and reminding us through your word about the, the, the fact that you use broken individuals to bring about your plan. And I thank you, Father, that we get a chance to look into that situation with the life in the life of Jacob and Esau today. Now guide our thoughts and our minds and just bless us real good today. I do lift up Stan and Doug and, and John and Pastor as, uh, as he struggles with his hip issue as well. I pray, Lord, that you'll bring healing and, and uh, comfort into their lives. And Father, just, uh, just restore them back to where they need to be for uh, for serving our church and serving you in this place. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Uh, last time we looked at how uh, Jacob, the supplanter, the trickster, some people call that word, uh, we, we, we looked at how he uh, stole his brother's birthright for, by mimicking his brother's Esau's arm hair, his smell, and his, uh, and his stew. Uh, after Isaac had uh, had been deceived by both his wife Rebecca and his younger brother or his younger son uh, Jacob, Isaac issued this magnificent patriarchal blessing on Jacob. It was the it was a grand blessing that he the was supposed to have given to the older son Esau, but he gave it to Jacob, uh, and again it rightfully belonged to Esau. But and, and Esau came in just as it was concluding, as he, he heard the benediction, if you will, on that, on that birth, or on that uh, blessing. And Esau was enraged. He was hurt, and he was uh, very sorrowful. Let's, let's begin our study today by, by reading this, and try to put, your, put, try to put yourself kind of in his, uh, in his shoes, so to speak. Genesis 27, verses 34 to 41 says this, when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried. I, I'm going to use the actual word. He wailed with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me also, O my father. But his father said, Your brother came with deceit and has taken away your blessing. And Esau said, Is, it, is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright. Now look, he has taken away my blessing. 
And he said, have you not received a blessing from me or have you not reserved a blessing for me? Then Isaac answered and said to Esau, indeed, I have made him your master and all his brethren I have given to him as servants with grain and wine I have sustained him. What shall I do now for you, my son? And Esau said to his father, have you only one blessing? And it, it, my father, please, or bless me also, bless me also, O oh my father. And Esau lifted up his voice, and, and again he wailed, he wept. Then Isaac his father answered and said to him, Behold, your dwelling shall be of the fatness of the earth and of the dew of the heaven from above. By your sword you shall live, you shall serve your brother, and it shall come to pass when you become restless that you shall break the, his yoke from your neck. So Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Here, here was the moment that everything came into focus for, uh, for Esau. He had he'd heard this beautiful, wonderful blessing uh, that had been given to his uh, younger brother, and I and I, <laughs> I kind of believe, given the family dynamic, that he probably saw a bit of a smirk on Jacob's face when when Jacob came in. Uh, that's just, that's just me. I would have smirked, but anyway. Uh, so so Esau he he heard this blessing, and now, then he begged his father for his blessing, but Isaac could only mourn the fact that he had lost this opportunity to grant this big blessing to, to uh, Esau, his favorite son. Uh, he, he, Esau then was blessed, but it was kind of a two-edged sword that he was blessed with because it would mean that their families would forever become enemies uh, against each other. Esau's family line, uh, for just in case you're interested, he, his family line became the tribe of the Edomites. Uh, you, if you look up the word Edomite in the back of your Bible, there, it's it's a very it's a very prominent word back there. Uh, and they were, in fact, the last Edomite was King Herod. Remember, good old King Herod. He's the one who uh, tried to uh, trick the wise men into telling uh, telling him where Jesus had been born. And so when they didn't. He went and killed all the babies that were born around that time in that area. He's really a nice guy, and he was the last of the Edomites. It, it's amazing how these uh, family squabbles, uh, not just here but throughout the, the Bible, they, they, they resulted in very real and, and dangerous conflicts. Uh, again, uh, it it just kind of makes me happy that we have. Uh, probate system and wills now. So it's, I think it's a good thing to have those. Thankfully, these brothers were able to work out a bit of a uh, truce of sorts. And let's take a look at how that went down. Let's go, let's go to Genesis 33, verses 1 to 4. <clears throat> now Jacob lifted his eyes and looked, and there Esau was coming, and with him, with Esau, 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah Rachel and the two maidservants, and he put his maidservants and their children in front. <laughs> He's such a brave man. Leah and her children behind. Rachel and Joseph last. That was his favorite, Joseph. We'll talk about that later next week. Then he crossed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. And he lifted his eyes and saw the women and children and said, Who are these with you? So a, a, a lot of things happened to Jacob during that 20 years uh, that, he, that he lived with Laban when he had not been around Esau. And it, it's, it's a fascinating story. Remember, Laban pulls a fast one on, uh, on Jacob, which is kind of neat. But anyway, uh, he pulls a fast one on Jacob to make him marry the girl he doesn't love, uh, thinking he was marrying the girl he loved. I don't know how that works. Those veils must have really been good, but 
he uh, he married L Leah first, and then he was and he had to work for her for several years, and then he had to work for several more years to get uh, uh, to, to to marry the one he loved. Anyway, bottom line was he uh, he, he he was tricked by Laban into, into many years of servitude. And he gets all this stuff together one night, and he escapes with his family and his goods. Uh, and but then he le learns that Esau is looking for him, along with about four hundred soldiers or, or men. They call them men, but they were soldiers, frankly. So so Jacob is having second thoughts, but but then he has that dream. And, and again, I'm going to ask you to well, look, we'll get to that in a second. But he has this dream where he where he wrestles with an angel of God, but that angel of God is none other than Jesus Christ. And and uh, in, during the, the, this wrestling match that lasted all night, uh, finally Jesus touched him in the hip and dislocated his hip, and uh, he and, and then he let him go. Uh, it was a quite a battle. But anyway, I, I, here's what I want you to do. The uh, it's too much reading for me. My throat's pretty raw right now. I want you to go back and look at Genesis 28 through 32. Just look at that whole whole episode of Jacob's, uh, uh, what how he came to be what he was. It, it's a fascinating study. Anyway, and just read it as history, if you, if you would, or as a narrative. Uh, and, but I would encourage you to look at that for your personal study. So anyway, when uh, Jacob and Israel, well, Jesus changes Jacob's name during, after the end of this battle. He says, Jacob, you're no, your name is now Israel. Uh, so he, and we'll talk about that name next week a little bit more, but uh, Esau, or Jacob meets Esau for the first time in 20 years. And since Facebook and Instagram and, all those, and X and all those things were in their infancy, uh, they really didn't know what was going on in each other's lives. Uh, and Jacob, frankly, was because of the way they had parted company, uh, he was a bit uptight. The last thing he had heard from his brother's face was this, this uh, warning from his mama, actually, uh, saying that Esau was intent on killing him. And, and, and here he shows up with 400 fighting men. And so Jacob makes a plan and he, he divides all the stuff into, into, into uh, entourages. Uh, he sends his uh, least favored wife forward with some of those children and then he sends, finally he sends uh, his favorite wife with, uh, with Joseph. Again, we'll talk about that next week. But he, he does this and then he also has a plan to offer a big tribute or uh, it was a restitution offering that he was giving to his brother. He wanted to give him an, a nice offering, uh, or some would call it a bribe. Anyway, uh, let, let's take a look at this plan. Let's go back in Genesis 32 for a second and look at uh, verses 13 to 21. So he lodged there that same night and took what came to, to his hand as a present for Esau, his brother. And here's, here's what his gift was going to be. 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes, those are sheep, and 20 rams, 30 milk camels with their colts, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 foals, those are baby donkeys. Then he delivered them to the hand of his servants, every drove by itself. So he, he would put the camels in one group, the, the cows and a different group and so forth, set them up so that they would come to his brother in, in droves, they were called. And he, he instructed his, his uh, servants, Let this, well, let's look at it. He says, then he delivered them to the hand of the ser his servants, every drove by itself, and said to his servants, pass over before me, so you go first, and put some distance between each of these groups of uh, these successive droves. And he commanded the first one saying, when Esau, my brother, meets you and asks you, saying, to whom do you belong and where are you going? Whose are these in front of you? 
Then you shall say, They are your servant Jacob's. It is a present sent to my lord Esau, and behold, he also is behind us. So he comm commanded the second, the third, and the fourth, uh, and, and all who followed the drove, saying, In this manner you shall speak to Esau when you find him, and also say, Behold, your ser servant Jacob is behind us. And he said, I will, I will appease him with the present that goes before me, and afterward I will see his face, perhaps, maybe, he will accept me. So the present went on before, before, went on over before him, but he himself lodged that night in the camp. So he sent, sent the gift, or the tribute, or the restitution ahead, but he stayed behind. So Jacob, has the, he's got this all laid out in his mind, how it's going to work out how he wants to appease his uh, brother's wrath. His, and I might add, his rightful wrath. He, 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 <laughs> Jacob owned it because it was his to own. Uh, Jacob knows the depths of the pain that he's caused by deceiving his brother. And, he, and he's willing to go to the extra lengths to make it right if he can. Perhaps, uh, perhaps he will accept me. That's the quote that I pulled out of that passage. It was That was the goal for Jacob. Now remember, this is in chapter 32. The, the, chapter, the passage we read earlier had to do with their final meeting, and that, that's where they actually did meet. And you notice that in that previous passage that Jacob bowed seven times. Now that's what you would do for, and, and let, me, let me try to describe this to you. He proceeded a, a piece, and then he fell on his face and bowed. He'd get up, he'd walk a little further, and then he'd fall on his face and bow. Uh, it, it was normal to do that to, say, a prince or a king one time. He did it seven times because I think he was, he knew he was on dangerous ground. Anyway, uh, he, he had, again, he had all this laid out, and, he, and he, he knows what he's done, and he wants to, he certainly wants to make things right somehow. So apparently, Esau's heart had been softened, and after the, the usual gift-giving protocols that happen in the Middle East, and I, I could go on for 20 minutes about how that works, Jacob's tribute was accepted, and they essentially parted on good terms. So let's finish in uh, Genesis 33, verses 8 through 11. Then Esau said, What do you mean by all this company which I met? Which I met? And he said, and that's, Jacob said, these are to find favor in the sight of my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. And Jacob said, no, please. If I have found favor in your sight, then receive my present from my hand, inasmuch as I have seen your face as though I had seen the face of God, and you were pleased with me. Please take my blessing that is brought to you because God has dealt graciously with me, because I have enough. So he urged him, and he took it. Now, I just had a rabbit to chase here. I just thought about this. It, Esau said he didn't, he didn't need it, and he didn't. He was a wealthy man himself by now. But he also did take it as an, a sign of acceptance of this peace offering that, uh, that Jacob had offered him. I think that's that's pretty interesting that he did that. He had every right to say no. I we're going to you and I are going to duke this out or however they're going to work it out. Uh, he had that right, but he he took the high ground. But Jacob also took the high ground. Okay, so what does that what does this have to do with us today? What's what does it, this Sunday school lesson? How does it what does it mean to me? What does it mean to you? especially in the, in the way of reconciliation when, when real harm has been done. And, and Jacob messed over his brother in a, in a grand way. So he, he clearly had, uh, he, he, he and uh, his mom, Rebecca, had put the dis in dysfunction. The favoritism that was shown by, by Isaac and Rebecca had put, it, it messed this whole family dynamic up. Their favoritism was blatant and it was wrong. And it set up this whole ugly 
chapter of history that, we're, we, that we just looked at. However, Jacob was willing, and he, he was a willing and crafty participant in all this, and, and it, would, it would bite him later. Uh, if you read about how Laban tricked Jacob, you might be tempted to say, <laughs> good on you, you deserved it, you got what's coming. But the real lesson here is, is the need for serious humility that causes deep personal repentance so relationships can mend. Uh, am I, are they going to be completely mended, completely everything all right? That, that's the first step. Uh, it, it, Jacob, I think, he, he did a couple things. First, he had this desire to restore the relationship with his brother, uh, and he didn't, he didn't pull his uh, birthright card to say, well, you, you, need, you have to listen to me because I, you, I am superior to you. He didn't do that. In fact, that was what he was trying to get forgiveness for doing in the first place. Uh, but he also went, he was willing to go the extra mile to restore that relationship. He was going to do something that cost him something. In Jacob's case, he, he, he felt the need to pay restitution for what Esau had lost. This, I, I believe, was the result of, of his humility even more than his fear of retribution. There's the, the flip side of restitution is ret, retribution. and He was expecting Esau to, to lash out, but he reached out and, and prevented that from happening. And I'm so grateful that happened. Does this mean that, that only we only do this when we've done somebody wrong? Uh, no, I think what we need to do is be attentive to what the Old Testament has to say. Uh, let, let's look at the list, this last verse, chapter, well, last two verses. Matthew 5, verses 23 to 24 has this to say. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. So this, yes, you, you remember you've done something that uh, has offended somebody. But the, the, the implication here is it may not even, you may not even think it's real. You may not think it's important enough to do something. But if you remember that your brother or your, this, this has to do with a spiritual relationship. If you remember someone has ought against you, is the old-fashioned word we used to say, you are, you are to go to them and try to make things right. By doing so, if you can reconcile, then it changes a lot of uh, heart dynamics in, in both of us, both of you. And, he, and, and really, before we can re truly worship well, we have to be at peace with our brothers. So, so Jacob was absolutely correct in seeing the need to reconcile what had happened because he was absolutely in the wrong. Uh, however, he also did the right thing, I believe, because he, because even if someone has something against you that, that you don't fully understand what's, you know, what's gotten crossways, as that's, that even you may not even understand that your problem. The implication from this New Testament passage is that we need to address the issue to, to be reconciled. Reconciliation requires humility. It's not easy to say, I'm sorry. And we certainly don't want to say, I don't understand what I did, but, but I'm sorry, because that doesn't mean anything. You just simply say, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Let's make this right. Let's work this out. Life's too short for us to, to have issues with each other. That's true in, in, in our work relationships. It's true in our family relationships. And it's certainly true in our church relationships. Well, we're going to look next week <laughs> into a, another situation where uh, uh, family dysfunction is uh, <laughs> it's really tough. It's the story of Joseph. Interesting that Joseph is Jacob's favorite son, and dysfunction seems to follow that, not that idea around. 
So look ahead in Genesis 42 and 45. We're going to be looking at how, how uh, Joseph and his brothers were reconciled. So do, do read ahead. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for loving us so much that you want us to get along. You want us to, to, uh, to relate to you. And before we can fully relate to you, sometimes we have to fix things with our, with our brothers and sisters. I pray that you will just, just focus in on our hearts and show us places where we, we can, uh, we can, we can become humble and, and suck it up and do what we need to do to, to get our relationships where you want them to be so that our lives can be a, a, that lighthouse that you want them to be. Now, Lord, I pray that you will take these uh, stumbling words, this, uh, this lesson that, uh, it, it, it's an interesting lesson, but it's also a hard lesson because most of us don't like to say, I'm sorry. It's, it's, it's just ingrained in us that when we do that, we're showing signs of weakness, but in your economy, to be forgiven is, is the most amazing and wonderful place to be. Thank you for your forgiveness for what you have done for us to make it possible so we can be forgiven and we can, we can spend an eternity with you. Lord, we love you. We thank you for what you're going to do. Now, Father, the worship service to follow is a special one for us as in Forest Brook. I pray that you would... Uh, just get glory and honor from it. Be with Brother Phil as he preaches. I pray that you would give him the words that you want us to hear. Words that just cut us to the, to the bone if we need it. Words of encouragement where we need it. Words of, uh, of, of challenge where we need it. Just make this, this day, this, this weekend, a, a magnificent story of the glory of Jesus Christ who saved us. We love you, Lord. Thank you for what you're going to do today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you know the drill. Uh, be sure to subscribe, like, and share th this lesson, and uh, particularly on your social media accounts. And, and we will see you next week if, if I'm not still sick. <laughs> May God bless, like, richly bless you, all of you.